Hello and welcome to Around the ICC. I'm your host, Matteo Bonetti, here to look back on the Champions League final between Chelsea and Manchester City, what to look out for in the upcoming Euros. I'll also be giving you my opinion on all the managerial changes that we've seen so early on in the season. And we'll have a bit of fun as well by picking out the top 11 from the teams that won the title in the top five European leagues. We have to start out with the biggest game of the season, the Champions League final, an all-English affair between Chelsea and Manchester City. And congratulations to Chelsea, who can now say that they are two times European champions as they narrowly beat out Manchester City by only a goal to nil margin, bringing Europe's most prestigious trophy back to London and proving what a difference a season makes. With Thomas Tuchel having taken over just a few months ago for Frank Lampard and turning the team's fortunes around, Chelsea showed throughout the game how versatile they can be, changing their tactics depending on the scoreline and the style of the opposition, and taking advantage of that City high line with the one goal, a perfect pass from Mason Mount to find a streaking Kai Havertz down the middle who had a step on City's Zinchenko. Havertz did well to round the keeper Ederson and to score a goal that no doubt will be the most important of his career. And even before the goal, Chelsea were knocking on the door. Timo Werner had some good movements and found himself in space, but wasn't able to be clinical with his finish. And perhaps the decision by City manager Pep Guardiola to not play any of his defensive midfielders came back to haunt him by halftime as both Fernandinho and Rodri were unused throughout the game, but could have probably given the team a bit more of a backbone. See the goal. Either way, it wasn't to be, and Chelsea fully deserved the win as they were the better side for most of the game, with Angolo Conte really bossing it in the midfield like usual. Another key moment that changed the course of the game, well, Antonio Rudiger's unbelievable challenge on Kevin De Bruyne inside the box stands out as being one of those moments that is a game changer. And let's not forget what a cool moment this was for U.S. soccer as Christian Pulisic became the first ever U.S. men's national team player to play and hoist a Champions League trophy. Pulisic also had a one-on-one -on -one chance to make it 2-0, but ultimately we'll forgive him for the miss as it ended up not mattering at all. And a shout out as well to City's backup goalkeeper Zach Steffen, another American who was an unused sub, but again, it shows the world that the US men's national team is soon to be a force in major competitions. Five things to look out for in the Euros because there can only ever be five, not four, not six, in these types of lists. So here we go with my number five thing to look out for is the Spain squad. The first without any Real Madrid players, most notably no Sergio Ramos. He was kept out of the squad. He's been injured, but Nacho, the other Real Madrid player, has been a standout all season with his versatility, but still not enough to travel for Luis Enrique this summer. At number four, will Kevin De Bruyne be fit for a Belgian side that got to the semifinals of the uh, World Cup in 2018 and have an absolute golden generation of players? De Bruyne was injured by Antonio Rudiger in the Champions League final. At number three, Karim Benzema is back and better than ever after a sensational season for Real Madrid. He's finally been called up again to the France national team squad despite an impending trial. He'll join the reigning World Cup champions who have already a ton of firepower with Kylian Mbappe up top. Coming in at number two is whether or not football's coming home. England manager Gareth Southgate has quite a headache when it comes to his best 11. With the nation pumping out a conveyor belt of young talent in nearly every position, the team should be energetic, young, entertaining, and, and ready to impress. But my number one takeaway isn't on the pitch, it's for the fans. Fans will be back in attendance and while we've started seeing some games later on in the season across Europe with limited attendance, this is the first major tournament that will bridge the pandemic year to hopefully a season that feels like normal and I'm expecting a buzzing atmosphere with tons of people ready to cheer on for their favorite player or nation in a star-studded Euro 2020. The coaching carousel has been, as the kids say, lit. These opening few weeks of the season, Zinedine Zidane stepped down from Real Madrid and nearly every manager left in Serie A. And that's where we'll be focusing on first. 
But let's start off with the crazy situation in Madrid with three names linked to the job. PSG's Mauricio Pochettino, ex-Inter boss Antonio Conte, and Real Madrid legend striker Raul. Real Madrid was linked before that to Max Allegri, who's been out of a job ever since parting ways with Juventus two years ago. But now that Allegri signed with Juventus, that's off the table. So let's move to Serie A, where things have been absolutely out of control on the managerial front. Conte left Inter hours after the club won the title because he found out that they needed to sell players to stay afloat financially. And Lazio's Simone Inzaghi replaced him. Over at Juventus, they sacked Andrea Pirlo after a disappointing season and brought back Max Allegri, the guy who took the Bianconeri to two Champions League finals and won the Scudetto every season that he was there. Over to Napoli, they sacked Gennaro Gattuso after the team failed to finish in the top four on the last day of the season, replacing him with former Inter boss Luciano Spalletti. Roma got rid of Paolo Fonseca for the special one, Jose Mourinho, who makes his Serie A return for the first time since winning the trouble with Inter more than a decade ago. Keeping up, I know it's a lot to digest, but wow, we have never seen anything like this anywhere in Europe the week after the end of the season. It's best 11 time. The five teams that won their league title in the top five European leagues are the only ones I can use. So, Manchester City in England, Inter in Italy, Atletico Madrid in Spain, Bayern Munich in Germany, and Lille in France. In goal, maybe a bit of a surprise, but I'm gonna go with Lille's Mike Mognon. Mognon held the record in the top five European leagues for conceding the fewest goals, only 23 in Ligue 1. At fullback, City's versatile Joao Cancelo has to be in there with his teammate, the Premier League player of the season, Ruben Dias, alongside as the wall in the defense. We move on to the other center back, and it's Inter Steven de Vrij, who played very well under Antonio Conte, while we go with the lightning quick Bayern Munich left back Alfonso Davies to round out the back four. Moving on to the midfield, and it is Atletico Madrid's Marcos Llorente, who was incredible under Diego Simeone, scoring 12 goals and getting 11 assists. While Manchester City's Kevin De Bruyne narrowly edged out his teammate Ilkay Gundogan, who I wanted to put on so badly on this list, but I couldn't because Bayern Munich's do-everything player Joshua Kimmich just had to be in this lineup for anyone to take me seriously. Up front, and we got so many goals. 41, in fact, for Robert Lewandowski, a Bundesliga season record, by the way. Inter's Romelu Lukaku kept being his usual unstoppable self, especially on the counterattack, and scored 24 times for Inter, while my 11 finishes with La Liga trophy winning striker who scored the goal that sealed the deal for Atletico Madrid, Luis Suarez, rolling back the years with 21 goals of his own in Spain. Thanks so much for joining us here, as always on Around the ICC, as we wrap up yet another season. And it was a weird one with COVID cases, no fans, congested calendars, postponed games. But we got through it in a time when any distraction was welcome. Football as usual provided that, giving us yet another amazing campaign full of crazy drama and storylines that gave us almost too much material to work with on a weekly basis. Now we'll be back soon, but for now, I leave you with the social media handles that you need to follow this second at INT Champions Cup on Twitter, at International Champions Cup on Facebook and Instagram, and make sure to check out the WICC this summer by going to internationalchampionscup.com and signing up for the presale. We'll speak soon.